From the Cronkite Studios in downtown Phoenix, this is Cronkite News. The school day is over and teachers are officially walking out of their classrooms, some until further notice. We're live with Red for Ed coverage. The clock is ticking for the Trump administration after a federal judge ruled they have 90 days to deliver a better solution for DACA, what this means for dreamers. And we give you a bird's eye view of Arizona's reservoir system and show you how water gets to your faucet. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Troy Lynch. And I'm Adriana de Alba. Thanks for joining us. It's a first in Arizona history. Thousands of school teachers will leave their classrooms tonight. Not sure when they'll return to class. They vow to walk out until all school employees get a pay raise and funding is restored to public schools. Cronkite News reporter Gabriela Becerra is live at Esperanza Elementary School where the walkout organizers just held a news conference. The final bell at Esperanza Elementary School rang, marking the start of the teacher walkout for the Isaac School District. Red for Ed leaders represented the thousands of educators that will be walking out of their classrooms and participating in the march and rally for higher education funding tomorrow. Here's what they had to say moments ago. Although our decision was a difficult one, it is an action that we take very seriously and is in response to a very serious inaction by our state lawmakers. We know that our decision is the right one. As I witness families, voters, and community members standing alongside us at our walk-ins, rallies, and protests. Tomorrow, you will see an entire community standing up for students and educators, demanding fully funded schools for our kids in preschool all the way to high school, now and for future generations of Arizona students. Tomorrow, participants will be marching from Chase Field to the state capitol at 11 a.m., followed by an all-day Red for Ed rally. Live at Esperanza Elementary School, Gabriela Becerra, Cronkite News. Teachers are also getting support from churches around the valley. Clergy people from different religions gathered at the Capitol to support teachers and the Red for Ed movement. The gathering included leaders from 10 congregations, the Arizona Faith Network, and one community. The group also announced that they will be providing food and child care for children across the Phoenix area. Reverend Redeem Robinson said that this movement affects all churches and people of faith. Many of our congregations are filled with teachers. So if we are, as faith leaders, we say that we're for the people, let's help the people who actually sits in our congregations every Sunday, every Wednesday, or whenever we meet. Tomorrow's walkout is the first of its kind in Arizona history. Be sure to follow Cronkite News on Facebook and Twitter, and tune in tomorrow night at 5 for full coverage on the walkout. President Trump has been adamant about dissolving Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, also known as DACA, which allows hundreds of thousands of people who arrived in the United States as children to apply for temporary protection. A recent court decision may have a big impact on the controversial program Trump has said is, quote, dead. In a court case brought against Trump's plans to rescind DACA, a federal judge in D.C. has deemed it unlawful, giving the administration just three months to provide more reasoning for the ending of the program. In Arizona, DACA advocates say this gives them more hope for permanent protection. Three more months, one more year, a few more days. Advocate and DACA recipient Abril Gallardo says she's tired of numerous deadlines causing uncertainty for the future of DACA. However, a new ruling has given even more hope for the Dreamers. A federal judge in Washington, D.C. is giving the Trump administration 90 days to make their case for ending the program. If not, they must accept new DACA applications. Two other federal courts have previously countered the Trump administration's effort to end the program, but one Phoenix attorney says this most recent decision carries more weight. It makes it more powerful because all the other court rulings um, merely allowed the renewals of DACA recipients, the DACA applications. This opens the program wide up, back to what it originally was. But Mark Krikorian with the Center for Immigration Studies in D.C. says this is not an issue for the courts. This is judges usurping the legitimate authority of the political branches of government. And it is illegal. This ruling is illegal. Krikorian highlights the lack of proper legislative process in implementing DACA. But fast forward to today, recipients like Gallardo says court action only motivates them more. 
all of the marches here in D.C. that we've been going, all the advocacy, all the lobbying that we've been doing is working. And it just gives me more fuel to continue to push for uh, permanent protection for immigrant youth. The Justice Department released a statement saying the administration will continue to defend its plans to rescind DACA. Lillian Donahue, Cronkite News. Reaction in Washington to yesterday's ruling was predict predictably along party lines. Arizona Representative Raul Grijalva applauded the ruling in a statement Wednesday, even though he said it does not sufficiently protect dreamers. The Departments of Justice and of Homeland Security both said in statements that their positions remain unchanged, that DACA was an unlawful circumvention of Congress that needs to end. White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders added Wednesday that the ruling was too broad broad and wrong, calling it, quote, bad news for national security. We believe the judge's ruling is extraordinarily broad and wrong on the law. What's worse is that it creates an incentive for more illegal immigrant youth to come here and causes them to expect similar judicial policies be applied to them. Arizona Representative Paul Gosar said in a written statement Wednesday that the ruling backed what he called an unconstitutional action by President Barack Obama. Bates is the third federal judge since January to rule against the administration's action to end DACA. The Justice Department has until June 27th to file a new argument for ending the program. Republican Debbie Lesko is the new representative for District 8. Lesko beat her Democratic opponent, Jairal Tepernini, by five points in a district where President Trump won by 21 points. Lesko is filling former Representative Trent Frank's seat after he resigned amid sexual assault allegations back in December. We caught up with both Lesko and Tepernini last night after the results were announced. We have made such an impact in this district. We have made an impact in this state. And when I say we, I mean we. We have done this together. Well, I think next I have to go find a place to live in Washington, D.C., hire my staff, get a district office and an office over there, and then I need to start working with my constituents and continuing to get the job done. One lawmaker called it a surreal experience returning to the baseball field near Washington where a gunman opened fire 10 months ago. But they all said it was important to return. As Cronkite News reporter Shelby Lindsay tells us from our Washington Bureau. After hours of heavy rain, the Simpson field was covered in puddles. But that didn't stop Republican lawmakers from coming together this morning for the first congressional baseball practice since a gunman opened fire in June 2017, critically injuring House GOP whip Steve Scalise and three others. Security was tight and armed Capitol Police were prominent as they ringed the field. Senator Jeff Flake, who was here for last year's shooting, said it was surreal to be back and playing catch with one of last year's victims. In left field, uh, Matt Micah uh, was hitting him uh, to me out there, and uh, Matt was, of course, shot right in first right in front of the dugout where, where we were, and then uh, shot again after that. Flake said he's been keeping tabs on Micah's progress over the last year. He was shot through the back, came out of the chest, and then in the arm, and so uh, he's had a lot of recovery. But to see him out hitting balls to us was uh, really gratifying. Scalise is recovering from follow-up surgery related to the wounds he sustained 10 months ago. But Texas Representative Joe Barton read a letter from Scalise. This year's different. The whole country is watching with pride as we come together and prove that one act of madness will not deter the spirit of camaraderie and philanthropy that has made this such a strong tradition in Congress. Play ball, Steve Scalise. Coming together in unity is what Flake said he will always take away from the tragic events that unfolded last year. I hope the memories we all take from it are not just uh, what happened that day here on the field, but uh, what happened with the Democrats' practice where they gathered in prayer and uh, the game the next day where everybody came together. And so that's, that's what I hope to take with me. Barton said the charity baseball game with Democrats will be played at Nationals Park on June 14th, the anniversary of the shooting. Um, we hope uh, we hope this year, uh, 
on behalf of the Republicans are behind me that, that, that the outcome of the game is more positive than it was last year. Reporting from Alexandria, Virginia, Shelby Lindsay, Cronkite News. The next time you drive to Mexico, you may experience higher police presence. Coming up on Cronkite News, how this new safety corridor will promote safety between the Arizona-Mexico border. Plus, we'll take you inside Palo Verde Power Plant to talk about renewable power sources in Arizona. I'm Judy Woodruff, anchor and managing editor of the PBS NewsHour. The journalists of tomorrow face a fast-changing media landscape, but quality news remains vitally important to our communities, our country, and our world. At ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication, students learn solid, reliable reporting, holding the powerful accountable, and rebuilding the public's trust. The Cronkite School and Arizona PBS PBS, preparing the next generation for a stronger future of journalism. As journalists at Cronkite News, we report on stories that matter to you by focusing on the local impact. We dig deeper and work tirelessly to keep you informed. Live in Wickerburg. Live in Los Angeles. In Cleveland. In Washington. In Louisville. From Jerusalem. Live in Philadelphia. From around the world to right here in Phoenix. At Cronkite News, we report the facts and stick to the truth. Millions of people die every year from drinking dirty water. I would never have felt I had the ability to do something without ASU pushing me. We built filtration systems out of local materials with the people. To see those kids drink clean water for the first time, it's the most rewarding feeling that you can ever have. I went to ASU because I wanted to change the world. The thing I never would have expected is how the world would have changed me. Arizona and Mexico agencies have partnered to create a first-of-its-kind safety corridor linking the two countries. Reporter Amanda Slee traveled down there to show us the impact this will have. This project along Mexico's Route 8 covers 60 miles after passing through the Loopville border leading into Puerto Penasco. Officials behind this binational effort hope it will help both countries in terms of reducing accidents and generating more visitors. Traveling on the highway connecting Phoenix to Rocky Point, one can spot small changes along the way, which officials hope will make a big difference in terms of safety and security. It's important for us to take care of our tourism, to make sure they're safe when they're coming here. The new Sonoita Puerto Penasco Safety Corridor is a collaborative project between several Arizona agencies, including ADOT and the Office of Tourism, along with nine Mexican groups like Federal federal and local police. The two governments working together to provide a smoother ride on one of the busiest stretches of highway between Arizona and Mexico, with almost 390,000 cars going back and forth in 2017. As soon as you cross the border, you cross into the safety corridor. We've repainted the roads and put new speed limit warnings in several trouble spots. In addition, bilingual signage will be posted and drivers will start seeing more specially trained police officers on the highway. Just taking care of the road, taking care of uh, when there was an accident, how to manage these situations, how to set up the trucks along the way, how to clean up the road. Quickly. Arizona officials are providing the training while the government of Sonora is investing in the actual improvements, with Rocky Point business owners saying this kind of collaboration between the United States and Mexico is a good step towards improving conditions and in turn generating more revenue. A benefit is economic growth because there's a lot of visitors that come to Puerto Penasco and that's good for our residents. Most of the tourists here in Rocky Point come from Arizona. Signage and other improvements along the road will help them get here safer. If we're not able to have a better city, have more activities, have more uh, things to do, it, it's going to be, you know, just the same flow of people coming and going. This is just a strengthening of the relationship uh, that was really a very a very simple and straightforward thing to do, uh, was embraced by, by people from both states. We need to understand that we might have difference, but we have much more 
things that we can do together. And uh, if all governors will follow this example that we have in Sonora and in Arizona, it will be a much better region for everyone. If this pilot program proves to be successful, officials will look into duplicating it on other roads and highways that connect the United States and Mexico. American Cronkite News. Oftentimes, leaving the streets and getting back on track can be a very difficult process. Cronkite News reporter Mari Nelson explains the journey of those who know what it's like not to have a home. According to the preliminary results from the point in time homeless count, the number of unsheltered homeless people in Maricopa County has risen by 27% since last year. We wanted to see what kind of help and resources are available to those looking for a way out. Hey, buddy. Good morning. How are you? Like I said, I worked all my life. I, I supported my kids. Uh, we had a house. We had cars. I was living the dream. That was then. This is now. Rudy Salas works at the Justice Center, a resource in Phoenix for older people experiencing homelessness, like Aaron Duchesne, who remembers when he first met Rudy. They looked up to me, went, oh, you're Aaron, and they shake my hand, they hug me, and All right, have you eaten, have you done this, uh, have you got that, what can we do for you today? Duchesne says Justa has become a safe haven. Co-workers say Rudy has a way of connecting with those like Duchesne who come in looking for help because he's been there. Just two years ago, he was homeless too. For about two and a half years, I was walking the streets just knowing nothing of resources because I really didn't know much about homelessness. Rudy says his journey to being homeless began when he was no longer able to work in his construction job because of a back injury. Disability soon followed. I was embarrassed that I didn't have a penny in my pocket to buy me a water, to buy me something to eat sometimes for a week or so. But Rudy says that wasn't the most difficult part about living on the streets. Having my dignity gone, uh, being embarrassed to go see my friends, my family. That was the hardest thing for me because, like I said, I never knew what, ex what it was to be homeless. But someone was there for Rudy. Oli Cowles was Rudy's counselor at the Justice Center. Oli has seen Rudy struggle and has seen him thrive. When he first started coming here, he was homeless. And along with that comes depression. You don't feel good about yourself. Um, you think the world's out to get you. And, and I think Rudy had some of those challenges and struggles. Oli recommended Rudy for a job at the front desk of the Justice Center. But after several months, he was promoted to the volunteer coordinator. Oli says Rudy is the backbone of organizing volunteers and assuring that groceries are delivered to people who were recently homed. Rudy is very compassionate. Uh, he's been there. He, he knows the struggles that homeless people have and he does what he can to go out of the way to help people. Rudy said that finding the Justice Center has been a turning point in his struggle with homelessness, and now he can't seem to stay away from it. I've been working seven days a week for a long time, but I need to give back. I need to give back to what I got. You know, it's, 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 it's very hard to explain when you go through a, a hard relationship of being homeless like that. The Justice Center helps homeless people who are 55 and older, not only providing them with food and hot showers, but resources to find jobs and affordable housing. In the Broadcast Center, Mari Nelson, Cronkite News. From the ground, it's hard to tell just how low the water levels are here in Arizona. But coming up on Cronkite News, we'll give you a special bird's eye view of Arizona's watershed and what SRP is doing to restore the water levels in our state. It's been a warm one out there today, Arizona. Stay tuned to yes, see if we're it expecting to hit the triple digits this week. I like working for Cronkite News because it gives us the opportunity to find a different angle on the same stories that every other news outlet is covering across Arizona. As students, we have the opportunity to cover issues in air, all across the state of Arizona. It gives me a good chance to sharpen my skills, improve my skills, learn the techniques in, in a newsroom and in, in the programs and teamwork and technology, getting me prepared for the real world. And at the same time, I think we do a great job, make some great stories, do great journalism for the city of Phoenix and the state of Arizona. I'm Jose Cardenas, host of Horizonte. Each week we bring you experts and community leaders to discuss the issues that are vital to our community here in Arizona. We cover the stories that affect and inspire us and our families and talk to the newsmakers who shape the communities where we live. Horizonte is your source and your voice for what matters most here on Arizona PBS. 
I'm Matt Barry, ESPN Sports Center anchor and graduate of ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication. With its bachelor's and master's degrees in sports journalism, the Cronkite School is preparing the next generation of sports journalists to tell stories that matter, stories that excite, inspire, and inform. Cronkite immerses students in covering sports at all levels in one of the country's top sports markets. It's this hands-on experience under the guidance of award-winning sports media veterans that shape the top journalist of tomorrow. There's concern over a ballot initiative that would increase the use of renewable energy here in Arizona. Cronkite News reporter Nicole Gutierrez was granted a tour inside the Palo Verde generating station and tells us how APS believes the plant, customers, and even other states could be affected. The Palo Verde Generation Station opened its doors to the media, not only so we can see what's inside the plant, but also know the repercussions a ballot initiative may have on their customers' budgets. Station in Arizona supplies one third of all power in Arizona and is the only plant in the world that uses recycled treated water. But for some environmental activists, this is not enough. From the perspective of someone who wants uh, clean, sustainable, renewable energy, uh, you know, nuclear power doesn't cut it. A renewable energy ballot measure proposed by the Clean Energy for a Healthy Arizona group is seeking to change the state's constitution. The initiative was passed and the constitution was changed to, to mandate 50 percent renewables by 2030. Uh, that Palo Verde uh, would probably be squeezed off the, the grid effectively by the, uh, by the oncoming solar that we would be mandated to produce. Obviously, here in Arizona, solar is a, a great resource that we have that we, we should be utilizing more of. And I, I think the public gets that, the voters get that, and they're very supportive of it. But APS doesn't believe relying solely on solar energy would be beneficial for Arizona. When we produce more solar than when we need during the daytime, especially in the cooler months of the year, uh, we actually will have to find a way to get rid of that electricity. Cadigan says excess electricity would cost billions to store, or Arizona would have to pay other states to take the excess electricity. Just as California already pays Arizona to take their excess electricity, now, although Arizona is abundant with sun, APS says that if the ballot initiative goes through in July and passes in November, customers' bills can go twice as much. In Phoenix, Nicole Gutierrez, Cronkite News. It's feeling pretty hot out there today. Yeah, Nicole, I heard it's going to hit triple digits in the next couple of days. What do you think? That's right, Adrian and Troy. And the crazy thing is, is that the first day of summer is still about two months away, but we've really been warming up here in the valley. Our temperatures today were actually about 10 degrees above the average this time of year, which is 88 degrees. Our highs in the southern part of the region and the western part of the region of our state were soaring today. Lake Havasu City, Quartzsite, and Yuma were all in the high 90s. Down south, Tucson was a warm 95 degrees. And over in the White Mountains, Sholo reached 75 degrees today and right here in the valley we're currently sitting at nine or 98 degrees with high thin clouds sunny clear skies winds will remain calm and the humidity is remaining stable at seven percent and now looking at your seven day well high pressure will remain in control this week keeping temperatures in the valley hot and dry but come Sunday, a cold front is pushing into the state, bringing with it gusty conditions and 80 degree temperatures to start off your work week, which is great because it'll finally feel like spring again. It's been a pleasure reporting your weather. In the Cronkite Weather Center, I'm Nicole Randock. The Colorado River system is not Arizona's only water source that's unusually dry this year. Reporter Nicole Hernandez takes us in the air to show us some of the state's other rivers and reservoirs threatened by drought. From the ground, it can be hard to grasp just how connected Arizona's waterways are, but a look from above can help show just how low the reservoirs are compared to years past. Salt River Project officials are expecting Arizona's watershed to hit record lows this season. I consider SRP to be a consummate full-time, always thinking about drought. We were formed because of drought, so therefore, we always plan for drought. Those plans include releasing and moving water between the seven SRP reservoirs throughout the state. But just because a reservoir is empty or low, it doesn't always signal a crisis. Well, that 
really creates this balancing act that we do every year in moving the water supply from the salt to the verde and then back to the salt. So we, we try to, we need to balance the storage and reduce the, the chance of spilling water as much as possible. The water that feeds into SRP reservoirs comes from northern Arizona mountains. In terms of the surface water supplies for the state of Arizona, about 17% of it comes from rivers inside our state. According to Charlie Esther, droughts are unpredictable, and because Arizonans are ultimately dependent on every source of water available, conservation is a long and complicated process. We're, we're really trying to be a good steward of, of all the water resources that we have available to us so that we can ensure our water future. To do that, SRP stores excess water during the wet years to compensate for the dry spells that constantly affect the state. Drought is just one end of the hydrologic spectrum. We've, we've also got to be ready for flood events. And as a hydrologist, I, like, I kind of like the flood events better, but most of my career has been, dealt, has been dealing with this drought that we're in. Now, despite the lack of watershed, the Salt and Verde River systems are holding enough water that state officials aren't too worried about Arizona's current storage levels. In Phoenix, Nicole Hernandez, Cronkite News. SRP officials say that it's normal to see drastic changes in watershed levels at the southwest climate as the southwest climate fluctuates. This story is part of El Elemental, a new public media collaboration covering sustainability in the West. That's it for Cronkite News tonight. Thanks for joining us. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org.